Welcome to our first in-person session for the talks for today. Uh, we are very lucky to have Ivan Ertloff here. And if people think that 10 to 15 years in the games industry is uh, considered a veteran, we would probably consider Ivan a dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> he approved me saying that, we're good. <laughs> Uh, I've been spent the last 20 years in a bunch of different uh, job titles in the industry. I uh, worked on games such as uh, Hitman, Anno, Risk, Painkiller. I'm missing one of them that I probably should have said, but there's so many. <laughs> I think he's got over 100 shipped games. And he's going to talk to you about the role of production. Is it just project management or something entirely different? What is project management? I don't know. You're here to tell me. <laughs> uh, for the people online, uh, ask questions in the Slido. We'll do some QA afterwards. And for the people here in person, we've got a bunch of merch to give away. So that's rad. Take it away. Thank you very much. So, yes, Dumb Ways to Die, courtesy of Playside Studios, where I'm holding my most recent production job as executive producer for Playside North, which is the Queensland studio, and the external projects, which is a fancy name for work for hire. Um, I started the slide with production. It's like doing drugs, but without the fun. And that's not just, uh, and it's not entirely true. Sometimes production is almost as much fun as drugs. No, um, <laughs> the thing is, no one who is in their right mind as a kid enthusiastic about video games wants to become a producer. You don't wake up as an eight-year-old playing Mario Kart all day, so I want to be a producer. I want to make crazy good spreadsheets <laughs> that enable my team to ship a title on time <laughs> in budget. No, you want to be a game developer. You want to be a game designer. You want to be a games artist. Production is something that tragically happens to you, <laughs> usually. So, so you, you like stumble into it or slide into it or fall into it and then it sticks to you and you end up becoming a producer. So, but that has not always been the case. And I think I've already, on my second slide, I prepared a selection of quite famous games, <coughs> Sid Meier's Pirates, and because I'm a total Sid Meier fanboy, I also have Civilization on the other side. Uh, David Brabant's Elite. I have no idea how you pronounce it in English. German, we say Elite. Um, and Gothic, so uh, which is basically the original Witcher, which is not even entirely false because we used to cooperate with CD Projekt a lot. That's a different story. However, um, my Slido quiz, I hope the Slido quiz is ready to go, is it? It's live. So, uh, all of those games that were basically milestones in their genre or founded an entire new genre and they are still remade, they still get sequels, they are still very popular. Um, how many producers do you believe worked on each of those titles? So, the I think the polls are up. Do I have to say when I close them? Okay, people are still voting, so yeah. So it's basically, I can I can give you a hint about the the, the team sizes. So we had on we had on pirates around eight people. We had on civilization originally twelve people, including the family testers. On gothic, almost thirty people, including Kai Rosenkranz, the composer. And elite was basically done by four dudes, and David Brabant did ninety percent of the programming. Amazing masterpiece. The original source code is a piece of beauty. But okay, so um, we have here. I've seen in the audience someone already guessed the correct number, but I will not give it away. Um, okay, I will close the poll now. We are standing at. Uh, it's it's a tie. It's an exact tie with 42% each between only one producer. The teams were way smaller back then. A very correct statement. Uh, two to three with shared responsibilities, which was something that came into uh, the gaming world a little bit later. No. Uh, 
I mean I gave you all wrong answers because the correct answer is someone has rightfully guessed on you because they read about it. Zero. Some of the greatest games that are still popular and are getting now remade with lots of producers on the project had no producer on the job. Uh, does anyone have an educated guess why? Aside of the team size, because Gothic had 30 people. No? That's correct. Uh, <laughs> that's the concept of a producer was not a thing back then. It was usually the most senior developer or the, the vision holder who created the original vision who acted as a producer. So on the old Sid Meier games, Sid Meier himself took the uh, position of a producer. And if you ever have the, the joy of talking to Sid Meier, you understand why. Uh, he has a beautiful producer mind, but his game designer mind is 10 times better and let's be just happy that he stuck to game design and made all the games we enjoy today. So yes, um, someone just did the job because they had to do. Someone had to take care of how many hours did we spend? Can we do it within the time that we have left? Can we do it within the budget that we get paid from Micropros? Stuff like that. Uh, so it was usually whoever drew the shortest straw became a producer. So how did I become a producer? Um, so I actually got my first game published in 1989 which is a year in which some of you weren't even born. Probably the majority wasn't even born, which is kind of depressing to think about. And it was a C64 text adventure with a little bit of ASCII graphics that you just walked through. Um, it was published by the 64 German magazine and it was groundbreaking because it had on the C64 with 48 kilobytes of usable memory full voiceovers. Why? Because I ripped out blatantly one of the first synthesized speech engines, SAM, back then, and wrote in basic 2.0 uh, game around it, and copyright wasn't a big thing, so the publisher just <laughs> published it and didn't look too closely why suddenly the dragon can talk. Um, so in 1992, I got the infamous 3D Studio 4.0 version that was illegally sold by Topware, you know, when you come from Eastern Europe, Legal, illegal, it's like, oh, everything's a gray area. Um, but I got my hands on a purchased, and therefore for me it was legal, on a purchased copy of 3D Studio, and I spent four or five years modeling, animating, rendering. So I taught it myself, and I went from hobbyist to uh, creating the animations for ray festivals that were projected on castle walls and stuff like that, where we have the connections to drugs again. Um, and then I actually focused more on my academic career and got my degrees. And uh, in 20 2002, I was playing a game called Europe 1400, The Guild. Has anyone heard of that? Which was basically Sims in medieval Europe with much more sinister murdering, poisoning, and lots of gypsies, uh, which is, as someone, uh, I've got a gypsy heritage, it was for me really fascinating, and uh, with my now ex-wife, back then still wife, we played it a lot in multiplayer. So we had local area network, we played against each other, stepped, drowned, poisoned, killed each other hundreds of times. However, the game was so bugged that it would not only crash, it would delete the last year's save game when it crashed. So you played for weeks on one single game and then crash, Safe game gone, the entire game is... A and, I, and I wrote a two pages letter to the publisher, Joe Wood Productions, uh, with creative insults in medieval language, because it's a medieval game. Uh, and they replied back with, uh, yeah, we are sorry, we are working on a patch. However, we are currently looking for a creative writer. Would you send us an application? <laughs> um, and I was a teacher back then, and I looked at what a teacher got paid, and I looked at what Joe was uh, paying, and it was not much more, but it was creative, and games, and writing, and like, like yeah. So I worked for Joe and for the Gilded Gold Edition, which had the add-on, 
I was already in charge of writing all the medieval insults that you could put onto opponents' houses. It was a very, very nice task. <coughs> I still have memorized some of them in all languages. Um, so, and then something happened, and I was promoted to community manager, and then Gothic 3 was released. Does anyone remember Gothic 3? Yes, it was a bug fiasco. It was an abomination in the eyes of the Lord, and everyone knew it. So, like, the producer resigned on the spot. The development studio, they walked away and signed uh, with Deep Silver so that they turned their back on Showwood, and we are not fixing that. We are not even patching that. We are now working for Deep Silver on Risen. Uh, and then Showwood recruited from the community uh, people who have modded Gothic 2 before and who were familiar with the tools. And then they looked for someone to coordinate those community uh, developers who had to fix the game. Uh, and that's the shortest straw. I picked the shortest straw and I was officially head of community development, which was a fancy word for underpaid producer. That was my first uh, producer role. Then in 2009, Showwood had acquired Dreamcatcher and we got all those great brands like Agatha Christie. Um, we got Painkiller and they handed over Painkiller development to me. There will be a story about that later and it's not necessarily a nice story but it came with the next promotion to head of development. And then I had the questionable joy of working on Arcania Gothic 4, and that's the last time I will admit in public that I worked on this game. It was a game where I resigned after a rescoping, and I will talk about rescoping a little bit later. Um, but I had my first producer credit, and uh, already a few contacts in the European and US game development world and when Anno wanted to create a mobile Anno game based on the original medieval style Anno and their online version of Anno, I was asked to produce it. Uh, and I convinced actually Ubisoft very early on to tear down all the paywalls and we made a free-to-play game without paywalls, which was back then something unusual, but it was successful enough to let the servers run two or three years, and that landed me the notoriety to be hired as producer for IO Interactive and Hitman. So um, they were back then, Hitman was like a typical, you buy the CD, DVD, you play through the game, it's done, and they had this big vision. Uh, we want to turn it into a games as service, without milking the player. So it should be like expanding and evolving like a free-to-play game, but people don't pay for that. They just pay upfront and then they get a year of entertainment, elusive targets and so on, and that was a really amazing concept and one of the best projects I ever worked on. We shipped it. It was good enough that you can now play, I think, the third sequel to it already still using the same mechanics and menus and everything else, but it's still popular. Uh, and I had the, the choice of remaining on Hitman, the choice between remaining on Hitman, or what I also produced back then, remaining on Red Bull Mind Games Challenge, which is basically a global, half digital, half in-person uh, intelligence championship. Or, and that was interesting, I got an offer from Sydney, uh, from SMG Studio, and they said, we have this board game license risk, and we have a small mobile game with currently 600,000 monthly active users, uh, and we need some uh, dry, crazy European who understands board games to produce it and lead it into the future, and I took that because it came with a 457 visa. I just had to prove the Australian uh, authorities that I'm a software developer. See, no one wants a producer. If you're a developer, you're fine. No one needs a producer. Um, and then I produced Risk. And I don't want to brag, but when I left Risk, it was on four different platforms and three and a half million players. And now I am working on, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to talk about it. There is an Australian Stock Exchange approved wording I'm allowed to say because we had to publish it. Uh, we are working for Meta on a um, 
mixed reality game for the next generation of Quest devices. That's as far as I can say. It's a very exciting project. It's largely developed uh, in Queensland by the Playside Studio there with like members from the Melbourne team and some uh, remote experts in their field. It's really, really, really a nice job. And I also uh, have merged my own company, Homegrown Games, which I founded in 2005, into the Western Australian Interstudio. So I'm now a minority shareholder of Interstudios. Yeah, Interstudio is uh, very present here today and also one of the main sponsors. Uh, so yeah, I'm now basically between Queensland and Western Australia, but yeah, enjoying my life as producer. So what does a producer do? Um, I think this is actually referring to film producers, but I found it hilarious enough to keep it here in the presentation. Um, especially what I really do, herding cats. Yes. Sorry, pardon my French. Fuck yeah. Uh, herding cats is 90% of a producer's job. Um, we don't blow money. Okay, sometimes we do, but not enough. We should have more. Um, and what my friends think I do, I would change that to what my colleagues think I do, because as a producer, you always need an ace up your sleeve, a bunny in your head. So you always expect the unexpected problems and you have solutions no one else has thought about. At least that's how you maintain the, we cannot fire him because no one else knows how he does it, status that's very, very valuable in your career. So what are core pillars of production? Not in terms of values, but what does the job entail? And uh, Caitlin mentioned in the introduction project management. And yes, project management is an important bit of it. Um, no one will deny that. There are so many methodologies uh, how to manage a project and how to set up a project. There are philosophies, there are like if you have lots of dependencies, you talk about the waterfall model. Uh, the Agile Manifesto was a revolution that led to Scrum, and all of that is blah, blah, bullshit. We sell you certificates uh, to a large degree. There is something valuable everywhere. However, every project is different. Every team is different. You cannot buy a book of Amazon, read it, and then apply it to every single project you work on. That will never, never, never ship a game on time. It's not going to happen. Because you also need team building. You have to look at the interactions between your teams. How are they communicating with, uh, with each other? Are the engineers and the artists sitting in their respective silos and the tech artists jumping between them, uh, desperately trying to negotiate the piece? Or how do we even get to the target performance? Um, and also, you as producer, and don't blame management, don't blame the greedy CEO, you as producer are responsible for the team health. If you as producer do not prevent crunch and burnout, no one else will. So you are the last line of defense and you have to act accordingly. Um, budgeting cost control for the more senior producers, yes, you have budget authority, you are responsible and you manage budget, which Sounds dry, is dry, but sometimes if you have some creative accounting, someone called it cooking the books, um, you can pull a few rabbits out of the head, no one else expected, and you maintain your legend status. Change management, in software development in general and in games development, we have constantly changes. I will get to that later, but yeah, that's a part of it. And vision keeping, which is, if you have like producers that come traditionally from a project management space without games experience, it's a challenge for them to learn this part because vision is something not very tangible. So project management, yes. Let me do that as quickly as possible. You take the project, you break it down into your deliveries, into your milestones, however the project brief is constructed, the contract with the client or publisher is constructed. You try to get to, uh, from the milestones, from the deliverables, you try to get to like the feature, you get to the user stories, you estimate it with your team, you plan the sprints, you deliver a game. There are so many different ways to achieve that. 
there is no right or wrong one. Uh, hands up, who prefers working with story points? Who's even worked with project management tools? Okay, who prefers hours? Like hours and days as estimates in the project management. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And who is wrong? Who prefers story points? Come on, don't be shy. No, <laughs> seriously, <laughs> there is no right or wrong. It's just way easier. And you can sell it so much better to the stakeholders and bullshit them so much more efficiently if you use hours instead of the wake concept of story points. Uh, Again, whatever floats the goat is acceptable. You run the sprint ceremonies, especially if you are an associate producer or like quite new to the job. You are probably the one doomed to go through the retros uh, and the mid-sprint check-ins and all the other nice ceremonies that you have and then report to the mid-senior executive whatever the outcome. Um, however, those ceremonies are actually quite valuable. Who hates sprint retros. Hands up. One. Okay, why? Um, I guess you can have a kind of a negative outlook on it after, after the retro your team can be quite uh, demotivated after it if it didn't go so well. But that's just my opinion. Yeah. Okay, uh, if you hand out, like, if you do it in person and you hand out, like, water on a table, you just add the right substances to the water to have them a positive outlook <laughs> on the project, which closes again the circle to the truck introduction. No, you've got actually a really good point. If a project is in a not ideal state, and if you are lagging behind, not even necessarily in times and money, but compared to the vision, the retro actually reinforces this negative sentiment. So you would not go into the retro knowing that people get out more depressed than before. Um, so yeah, again, good answer. Uh, what you also do is the reporting to your stakeholders, to the board, to the publisher if they are looking over your shoulder. You do the projections. Will we hit the milestone after the next milestone in time? And what's my uh, confidence level? 82.5%. I always make it a 0.5% because that sounds like I didn't totally make it up. And I made it totally up. But it sounds like some mathematics were applied. Uh, and you do risk management. And this is something that is usually not mentioned and emphasized enough when new producers are trained or shanghai or captured somewhere to become producers. Risk management is one of the most important bits that you can work on. And don't do it alone. Don't sit yourself somewhere into a, uh, in, a, in a dark room and think about all the possible risks. You can start that, but then you go to all the discipline bits. You talk to your engineers. Uh, you talk to your QA that has already had a look at the first builds. You talk to the artists. You talk at whoever built the abomination you call a build machine and CI delivery system. What are the risks? And then you have a much more sophisticated list and you can each week escalate, de-escalate, or perhaps even kill the risks. So, team management. Yes, what I said before. Team communication. So, here up there we have here a tech artist who has been brought way too late onto the project, where the developers have already uh, built upon prototyping code something that um, probably could summon Cthulhu in the wrong context. Um, the artists looking at their vision, ignoring what's happening left and right, and building 50 million polygons assets for a mobile game. And the tech artist, because his role has traditionally a very underestimated value in most companies for the whole project doesn't speak up. And that's a recipe for disaster. So the, the producer has to make sure that all disciplines talk to each other, all stakeholders talk to each other. You align, you make sure they communicate, and you make sure the documentation is up to date. Because every time you have a new starter on the team, if you don't have one single source of truth, you risk that they go to 
their mentor department lead and they get already started on a wrong set of informations. So always for each project have one single source of truth. And if you use Confluence, that's it. Never have a situation where you as producer point to Confluence, hey, we were talking about eight levels and someone says, yeah, but in the Slack channel with all the leaders inside, we have actually agreed on five levels. You don't want to get yourself into such a situation. You would say, whatever is in Slack does not exist. It's dead to me until it's in Confluence and has three checkboxes from everyone. Um, your team health and moral monitoring and improvements, make sure that people are, and that also means not only looking at the weekly hours that are used, um, at the overtime in the evening, it actually feel the room, read the room. When you see that people start, they still work the same hours, uh, they still tick the survey box with I'm eight out of 10 in well-being, in culture or whatever tool you use, but you see that among the disciplines or between colleagues, hostilities, disagreements start becoming more often. It's like one of the first indicators that people who used in the same meeting to joke around and be very uh, casual, friendly, lovely, they start getting passive aggressive. That's like the first step where you know you are going towards hell and you have to do something. And alignments, everyone should be on the same page. Also avoiding and removing blockers. Oh my God, that's 90% of an in the trenches working producer's work. And it's not only removing blockers, it's also preemptively seeing the blockers, like blocking dependencies, if someone doesn't know what a blocker is, um, and remove them before they even trigger. So there shouldn't be a situation where I couldn't work on this level because X hasn't been done, and X hasn't been done because a stakeholder that only you communicate to hasn't signed up or off on a concept before. So something like that should never happen. Read that beforehand, remove it. Sometimes you run into dependencies, resolve them as quickly as possible. Budget and cost control. This is boring. <laughs> no, seriously, it's someone has to do it. And if you do it right, you always have a side stash and you can trade off, oh, we cannot hire two more artists in time to ship it, but we can outsource now with the 3050k I've stashed aside. But that's boring. And only senior and above are actually, senior producers and above are actually doomed to deal with the costs. If you are a producer or a junior producer or an associate producer and you have bu budget responsibility, you are underpaid and your job title is wrong. No, seriously, no one under a senior should be responsible for the uh, budget. Good, change management. Um, what's change in video games? Sometimes you have the client changes what they want. The publisher has discovered a new trend. Yesterday we had an amazing marketing session in the evening. It was the last session yesterday where we were told not to chase trends. Amen to that, but tell that to the press somewhere at <coughs> not calling out any large publishers like EA or Ubisoft or someone like that. Um, they chase trends, they change the scope of your project, even if you delivered every single milestone and they signed off on every single bit of documentation that you have lined the entire development up to release, you still risk that a dude comes in from marketing with zero idea how a game is made and says, oh, we need DLC. Okay, <laughs> and then you suddenly have to plan for a DLC, and that's, that's, that's actually easy. Sometimes they come in and say, we should monetize this feature. And yeah, if you cannot fight it, or if you don't know where to get assassins to take care of this stakeholder. By the way, Chechenia is currently overpriced, go to Romania. Um, then you have to deal with that, and yeah, you are down the change management route. Team changes, people resign, people start. That's something you calculate in, but sometimes you have like really shifts. Like if you work, especially across, imagine a few months ago or a year ago, one and a half years ago, you worked on a collaborative project with Mighty Kingdom, as an example. 
you have structural changes in one of the partners, you have to deal with that. Um, project structure changes. Yes, a new production director comes in, he changes structure and process and you have to deal with that. Uh, company changes, that's actually funny. Because does anyone know Phenomic, the development company Phenomic? So it was an independent German development company, uh, really strong in the RTS, uh, fantasy RTS world. They made spell for us, they made spell for us too. And they were so successful as independent developers uh, that they were bought out by EA. And it was really a cash in a suitcase deal. EA marched in with cash in a suitcase, and they can sue me because I can prove that. No, but um, that, that's <laughs> the thing is, <laughs> I was not that phenomic. I worked for the publisher. However, they had a contractual obligation to deliver the game they were already working on, and it would have been way more expensive to pay damages to the competing publisher than to just say to the team, Ship it. But you are suddenly not dealing with an independent company, you are dealing with a subsidiary of Electronic Arts with uh, a legal department that probably makes more money than you in the entire company over a year. So you have to change your communication, which means you have to be really, really nice to people you usually wouldn't be that nice to. But stuff like that happens. Uh, then Unreal and Unity. For whatever totally unexplainable reasons we have seen in the last days and weeks, uh, Unity developers flocking over to Unreal. Um, but even outside of uh, interesting pricing models, uh, the switch between Unreal and Unity is something that happens actually quite often. You also have teams going from a more fringe engine, like I shipped games on FPC and Games Guru and stuff like that, but there are like people going from RPG Maker to Unity, especially small indie teams. You have people who have tried to ship something big in Godot, and then they go to Unreal. So it happens, and it's a lot of change. And then you have the super fringe examples of change management. And let's talk about this game here, game, Right to Hell Retribution. Has anyone ever heard of that game? One, two, three, four. Who hasn't heard of that? Please afterwards jump onto YouTube and, and watch like the first 10 uh, videos. But actually it started with Deep Silver handing out for Deep Silver a record sum of money to a studio to beat this game. Which is as delusional as you would assume. But they said, so yeah, okay, with like help from Eastern Europe, cheaper labor, and, and just a few creative writers, we can wing it and we can do something as great as GTA. And they realized around two thirds in that that's not, it's not going to happen. Even if we spend three times the money and double the time that we already wasted, still not going to happen. So they wanted to create this hard, tough image like 80s action movies, Jean Claude Van Damme, but in a rocker scenario with drugs and hippies and lots of sex. They went totally bananas, and I have no idea how this idea of rescoping survived any stakeholder meeting, but it got released on all platforms. And oh my God, it's gloriously bad. You have to check it out. But this was also an outcome of change management. It was just managed very, very badly. Okay, how are we looking for time? So, okay, um, that's actually suspiciously close to my planning. <laughs> ah, producer, right? <coughs> um, okay, let's talk about vision keeping. Uh, again, if you are the vision keeper on a large mid to triple A project, everything above 20 uh, people on the team, and you are the vision keeper and your title is not at least senior, you are underpaid. So vision keeper doesn't necessarily need to be a producer, but sometimes it's the game designer, which is a terrible idea because game designers, I love game designer, I identified as game designer for a while in my life, um, but they tend to creep scope as fuck. 
That's just, if you leave three game designers alone with your game design document, even if they don't have tools to edit it, you just put it on a USB stick, give them no device to read the USB stick, lock them up in a room, the game design document will double in size every day and you have no idea why. That's like how game designers work. So uh, most of the time it's, it's like uh, a head of development, sometimes even a GM who has enough time to take care of the actual game making, or it's the lead producer who is usually a senior or an executive producer. Important, they do not, the vision keeper does not define the vision. He was perhaps part of the process. It came up in a collaborative, ideal in a collaborative process, everyone aligned with the vision, and his job is to keep the vision. Um, from the vision, you can usually derive pillars that you check decisions against. So if one of your pillars is, in our game, we prefer credible stealth, stealth that feels actually like stealth over combat. Then you have a really good pillar to not only uh, check the mechanics, but also the level design against. So do I even need this elaborate level design if my job is to stealth around three dark corners and then hit someone from behind? So it's actually a decision-making help. And yeah, but what is the vision? Vision, the problem with vision is that it's usually very broad. Uh, if I would ask you what the vision, let's take an example. Uh, who is an XCOM fan? Ah, people of taste. Thank you very much. So if I ask you what the vision of XCOM is, you would say so like, ah, human resistance against aliens, or turn-based tactics, or missing with a shotgun from one and a half meters away and a 92% chance of hitting. Yes, that's all XCOM, but it's not the vision. So the vision is much broader. By the way, the Advent burgers were really tasty. Um, it's easier if you can boil down the vision to a mission statement. A mission statement is basically one sentence that in worst case, if you have to make a tough call, you check does it align with the mission statement. And I brought you a few examples. So, um, this was Hitman, and Sapienza was the last level I actively worked on. I still think Paris Fashion Show, that was the peak of my career. I will never make anything better, and I should retire. Uh, but Sapienza, that was the last bit that I worked on. Um, and I remember very vividly, like, the vision was ingrained in everyone, no matter if you worked in Copenhagen or Vienna, uh, or even in the outsourced art teams, everyone was like, we make the best kill people sandbox in the world. So like, it's ma more important to have 100 creative ways of killing your target than anything else. If the animations are not perfect, screw it. Uh, if the grass doesn't look like in Far Cry four or five years earlier, Far Cry 3, doesn't matter, as long as it's this believable sandbox. And I think we actually pulled it off really nicely and blew ridiculous amounts of money doing so.
So, yes, if you looked carefully through the eyes of a game developer, you saw a lot of things that were that were by that were no way perfect. Not for a <coughs> 100 billion euro project. I'm not telling you exactly the number because it's insane. Uh, but like. As I said, the grass, the water shader looks pretty, but it's nowhere near where the best games were in 2016. The animations during the combat scene, they were already carefully created for a cinematographic, it was all in-game, but of course carefully created with camera flies and everything else and scripts written for this trailer. They still didn't look great. There were some textures on the wall that I had in indie games at the same time better. It all doesn't matter because we give you this beautiful fictional Italian village to go and murder as you please. And that was the job, and we kept to the vision. And this is an example of an artistically, <coughs> a little bit morbid, but artistically impotent vision. It does not say that every vision needs to be aspirational. Y if you work in the industry, you will sometimes work on projects that you do for the money. Uh, if, if anyone has illusions regarding that, I'm sorry, but you will end up at, in worst case, you will end up working for a project where the vision statement is, we want to release a mobile game that makes billions of dollars in revenue. And most free-to-play joints, especially the largest one, work exactly like that. Every game design decision, every artistic decision is checked against financial KPIs. They don't care if it looks aesthetically pleasing. They care if the look reaches the highest amount of players possible. Does it align with the highest percentage of each target audience? And before they even talk about the target audience, the audience is defined as those who pay most money. Everything is designed with the lifetime value of the user, the retention, and a few other metrics that make it really sad to design a game for that, but it's possible. And if your mission statement is, let's make $10 billion, you create something like that. It's Clash of Clans. I'm not playing now the TV commercial for Clash of Clans. I've embedded it. Does anyone want to see the official Clash of Clans TV commercial? No. I, I assume so. Um, it, it has some interesting things with like, it's violence, but it's not too much violence. Uh, it, it's exciting enough that an adult with a low standard bar would be tricked to play it, but at the same time, it's cute enough to trick children and young adults. So it's, it's like, psychologically speaking, it's a masterpiece if you work with this vision statement. And the game itself is a masterpiece if you compare it against this vision statement. This game made more than 10 billion US dollar revenue. Do you think that puts it on top of all free-to-play mobile games? No. Does anyone have an idea what currently the number one is? Hands up. Yes. Number two, <laughs> Genshin. <laughs> Arena of Valor with 18.9 billion US dollar in revenue and still going strong, which is, yeah. But as said, that can be a mission statement, then work accordingly. Why does it start twice? No, don't do it, don't do that to me. Okay, so how does one become a producer? Obviously, you haven't listened to the talk, because otherwise you would try to do everything else than being a producer. How do we go on time? I have 50 minutes left, okay. Um, organic development, I mentioned that. It's usually you work in a team that happens often with student teams as universities. They work on their first game. And someone from this team evolves as the least chaotic person, the most organized person, the one who actually writes the report that gets handed in with the professor. Welcome, you're now a producer, if you want or not. Or they tried another discipline they worked in engineering, or they tried 3D modeling, or they tried animations, and realized, I will never make a professional career from that, but I want to stay in games. And then you look at your options, and you can either go the high route 
and do something that's perceived as not so exciting, but one of the most valuable and important positions in the business. It's not producing, it's QA. Uh, or you become a producer. Um, or you come from project management outside of games. I was yesterday uh, reminded that this sometimes is really, really challenging for people who have a really solid project management background, even software development project management background, but never worked with an art team as an example. So if you come from the outside, you can learn it, but you have to learn fast and you have to learn the technical dependencies. Um, come from QA, actually a really good pathway QA to producing. Someone has to do it, shortest straw. And the last point is my favorite. You, you get tricked by one of those ads and you do a PMBOK or a Scrum certificate or whatever. And instead of printing it, taking it to the beach, burning it in an empty barrel and dancing naked around the fire, which is the best value that you can get out of this paper, you go and uh, hunt jobs. Um, sometimes you land a job and then you can actually learn how to produce and you become a producer, perhaps even a great producer. Because I have trashed talk jokingly producing a little bit, but don't get me wrong, it's in nine out of 10 games, if the producer was empowered by the structure and the management to solve problems, to get everything done that's needed to be done, the producer decides if the game ships or not. The producer decides if it goes over project, uh, over budget or not. And they also have a huge influence on quality. So it is one of the most important jobs. Unfortunately, in the industry, you're not always set up for success because of political reasons, because of company structure, because budget cuts in worst case. Um, so how, do you, how are you a great producer? If I ever see one, no. Um, it helps to have a development background. So uh, the best producers that I know, and I'm not counting myself here, uh, <laughs> I was very lucky in my career, but the best producers that I know have game development background. They have actual engineering and art and tech art background. They know how everything plays together. Therefore, they have a much higher level of empathy. They can communicate technical requirements better. Like all of those things that I have listed here, it's easier if you have developed games before. If you start with producing, start developing games. Unity was free, haha. <laughs> no, uh, Unity is still kind of free. Unreal is free, download it, start making games. Even if your day job is moving spreadsheets. Doesn't matter, make games and you understand way better why those numbers are in the spreadsheets. Um, be empathetic, Nanona, of course. Uh, be creative, and I'm not talking about writing poems. I love writing poems, don't get me wrong. Uh, I'm talking about creative solutions. You cannot play every situation by the book because you will come in situations where no book exists. You will find obstacles no one has ever talked about. If an engineer runs into a compile error, they can Google it and <coughs> Stack Overflow has the solution. If it's the right solution, we don't know. Uh, but it has at least some lead to a solution. You will run in producing because every project is different, every team is different. You will run into problems no one has solved before. You are the first, good luck. Creative solutions. Technical, I explained why. Diplomatic, yup. Um, you have to communicate with stakeholders. Be firm. So towards the team, and I have it here in a few points and it mixes a little bit. For your team, you are the shield that protects them from management. You are the shield that protects them from the stakeholders. So whenever the bullshit starts raining from the sea suit, which happens, uh, you are the umbrella protecting the team. At the same time, you have to be firm. If you have a team that constantly commits to something and does not deliver, you don't go to your stakeholders, so hey, CEO, we will not ship in time, but it's, it's you know, it's Pete, the, the medium software engineer somewhere uh, in the third floor, it's his fault. No, that's your fault, you are the producer. 
So if you have seen a problem there, you should have solved it. Uh, so you are basically the sponge that has to absorb all the toxicity in the business. I'm still not selling the job really well. Um, no, <laughs> no. Uh, protect your team, but be firm. Communicate your expectations clearly. Communicate the board's expectation. Even if they say, uh, don't tell the team. No, you tell the team. So um, it's the same. Jesus Christ. Everyone thinks uh, because um, executive producer and what, what else and because I have this long career. Um, everyone in every industry talk to each other about your salaries, about your wages and join the fucking union. That's just a sidetrack, but join the Game Developers Union. It's part of the Professionals Australia. They are doing a great job. Join the union. Um, put your money where your mouth is. You can afford it. Um, so, and pick your battles carefully. And this is interesting because sometimes the stakeholders come to you and they come with an unreasonable request, but you can't do it easily. If if the CEO's daughter tested the game at home and she comes to daddy and says, the buttons in the third menu should have a different color, and you know it's a job of 30 minutes. It doesn't change the, the appearance at all. It's just, it's unnecessary, it's stupid, but it doesn't hurt anyone. You do it, you say, wow, an amazing idea. Thank you so much, and it's in the, in the next build. And that's how you build your political capital and the next time you come to the CEO and say, so I need five more engineers, <coughs> gonna be expensive, <coughs> you have much better cards. So, yeah. And know when to resign. If you are not set up for success, if you see all the problems, you know how to solve it, you have the solutions, you have sanity check the solutions, it's not some brain fart that you have sitting on, but you have the buy-in from leads, and you have communicated that up the food chain, up to the board, and they ignore you and tell you no, then you walk away. You resign, you give one last ultimatum in writing, CC everyone, including external stakeholders who love you. Very good pressure point. <coughs> and if they still don't give in, you walk away. Because there is nothing more terrible than uh, Seeing people being burned out and shipping terrible games and knowing you could have avoided all of that. That's my advice. How many minutes do I have? I had some really good war stories, but I'm out of time. So g hit me with the questions. <laughs> uh, I will say Ivan will be around all week, so feel free to <laughs> come and ask him more questions and hear his war stories. They're actually very interesting. <laughs> uh, so the first question, in your opinion, who sells more magic, marketing or the producer? Sales, marketing, <laughs> delivers producer. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> uh, second question here is, how might you influence a senior exec producer that has drunk the scrum Kool-Aid? <laughs> Too much to be more flexible in their approach. Can you can you repeat it? How would you influence a senior exec producer that has drunk the scrum Kool Aid? To you. <laughs> so if you're a senior or executive producer, uh, still believes that a single methodology has the answers to all problems, you should get a new executive producer. So it's like. It's not fixable. It's why sometimes muskrats just eat their offspring right after giving birth. <laughs> it's like wasted resources. So, yeah. Uh, I think that's all from online. Did anyone in the audience have any questions? Hey, great talk. Um, I had a question about design pillars and I guess like your vision statement. Do you have a way that you would work that into your process in like ongoing development? Like, do you have like regular reflection or something that you would do? So, uh, an excellent question. Um, when we spec a feature in the planning phase, we would never do that without the senior designer or the feature designer present and ideally the senior or lead designer on the project. Uh, 
if it only touches barely any of the topics of our pillars, uh, it gets reflected at this stage. And when we write up, like, I cannot talk about my current project, but if I had a very level-based game, like a typical shooter, 15 levels, then you would take the concept, the visual concept, the level design, and the game design concept for every single level and discuss it before you sign off the level that for art production and uh, mapping. I mean, I've, I've spent a lot of time with Ivan and he's given me a lot of really good advice so I can ask you questions that your answers gave <laughs> me a lot of valuable insight if you'd like. Do you have one? <laughs> uh, I think one of the most valuable things that you said to me was the way that you negotiate that you mentioned before about uh, you know, having diplomatic favours. It was very civ of you. <laughs> uh, how would you work that into like an actual situation? Uh, in an actual situation, let's say I have a stakeholder meeting, I show uh, the progress, uh, I show the, let's say we are at um, halfway between vertical slice and alpha, we are showing the progress from the vertical slice, everything has been developed to a spec document uh, that the stakeholder has signed off, and now the stakeholder throws in ideas like, um, could we add an additional puzzle here to extend the playtime? Or I really like ponies. Can we have ponies in the outdoor levels? So you would, you would look at what's the most expensive thing to do and you mentally rule it out. And what's the cheapest thing to do that my stakeholder or client is the most excited about? And then I communicate that and usually it's Sometimes if it's a larger change, it's basically that you rescope the change mentally to something that you had already planned with in the past. So it might be that your client's super favorite A option is something that has been in development, your B option for a long uh, time and you know it would work. And in this case you would give in and sell it to the client as his idea, but at the same time, you push back on everything else. So you give them one win that makes them feel great and take away everything else from them. And ask for more money. Ask for more money. While you're at it, ask for more money. Never say no when the client offers an extension yeah. on the deadline. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Never. Uh, cool. Wait, let me just check. We have another question. Regards to hiring, what value do you place on education? Would you be more impressed with the portfolio of someone's qualifications with no industry experience? Yes. <laughs> 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 no, no, seriously, I, I got in Australia, I actually went because it was COVID, uh, I was locked in the Blue Mountains and I got bored, I got actually an Australian degree and I have a few European ones. But in the end, um, they are really good courses, they can teach you a lot but a shipped game on any market, an amazing portfolio. Uh, source code that blows my mind is always more valuable than a formal education. Really ugly Gantt chart, but it's very well thought out. Exactly. <laughs> so there is someone in the room who has definitely made the worst Gantt chart I've seen in my entire <laughs> life. But, but the fundamentals, like at which point would you bring QA into the uh, process or uh, how do you sequence things without going into a hard waterfall dependency, that was perfect. It just looked terrible. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, cool. We are at time. Just check in case there's any really next ones. No, that is, that is all. Thank you so much. You have a bunch of merch for the people in the room, but we will sign off the live stream now. You guys are all missing out. Um, but I reckon the... No, I don't right. reckon there'll be any left when you get wait. here later. Sorry. <laughs>